When we go out to eat, we never agree on where to go. I want burgers! Pizza! Tacos it is. The one thing we do agree on is we all want unlimited high-speed data. That's why we switch to Metro PCS. Stop by Metro PCS with the whole family and get four lines with unlimited LTE data for just $100, period. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figure it out. Coverage not available in some areas. Offers require reporting of number not currently active on T-Mobile Network. During congestion, the fraction of customers using more than 35 gigs per month may notice reduced speeds. Video streams up to 40p. No tethering. See store for details and terms and conditions. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Nonprofit View, a forum where nonprofit stakeholders can share lessons learned and discuss the latest developments in the industry. My name is Valerie Leonard, your host. I'm a consultant to nonprofits, and I specialize in community and organizational development. I work with nonprofit organizations to help them make a stronger impact to their clients and communities. You can find Nonprofit U on Facebook and Twitter, and I encourage you to comment early and often using the hashtags Nonprofit U, Navigating Change, or Strategic Planning. You can also leave comments on blogtalkradio.com forward slash nonprofit underscore you. The chat room is open, and you can post comments and questions. In order to use the chat room, you must open a listener-only account. You'll find a link to open the account on the episode page, and you can also email me questions at consulting at ValerieFlinner.com or send messages through Facebook and Twitter. You'll find a Nonprofit U fan page on Facebook, and the Twitter account is at Nonprofit U. We'll be taking questions by phone and from our chat room at about the 20-minute mark. The call-in number is 347-884-8121. As you know, the nonprofit landscape is changing dramatically. In spite of the fact that the national and state economies are in recovery and foundations are giving more money, many nonprofits are finding it difficult to raise funds. The state of Illinois has unilaterally, or taken it upon themselves, to terminate contracts with nonprofit organizations, and the fact that they don't have a budget in place makes it impossible to make appropriations unless a lawsuit is successfully filed on behalf of the nonprofit organization. So you can imagine it's a very difficult environment. Foundations' priorities are constantly changing, And generally speaking, they don't fund organizations for the long term. Nonprofits must position themselves for sustainability in the marketplace. However, any discussion regarding sustainability must begin with strategy. So today's episode is Navigating the Winds of Change, the Importance of Strategic Planning. We'll talk about what strategic planning is, its relationship to business planning, how to develop a theory of change, how to engage internal and external stakeholders to maximize buy-in, and how to align your strategies and programs with the organization's mission, vision, goals, and objectives, and finally, how to develop and monitor your work plans. Again, we encourage you to call in with questions and participate in live chats at about the 20-minute mark. The call-in number is 347-884-8121. Nonprofit professionals are especially encouraged to call in and share your war stories and strategies. And even if you don't have experience in nonprofit, your calls are welcome. There is no such thing as a silly question, just um, questions that remain unanswered. Um, again, uh, give us a call. Our call-in number is... So we've got a lot of ground to cover here. Uh, We'll be looking at what a strategic planning process is, its relationship to business planning, how to prepare a strategic planning process, how to develop a theory of change model. We'll also be looking at how to engage people from the inside and from the outside of your organization to make sure that there is buy-in at the maximum level. We will look at ways to make sure that your strategies and your programs are in sync with your organization's mission, vision, goals, and objectives. And then we'll look at how to develop and monitor work plans. And finally, we'll look at how to conduct evaluations and measure progress 
and to maintain what we call continuous improvement. So again, like I said, we've got a lot to cover. The first thing we want to look at is what is strategic planning itself and, and how is it different from business planning? So strategic planning is a process in which an organization, you know, you, you look at your mission, vision, core values, and then you try to figure out, given those mission, vision, and core values, how you can position yourself to capitalize or take advantage of the changes in the environment. And at the end of the day, you're going to have a set of strategies to achieve a set of long-term goals and objectives for the organization. And then your critical questions you want to answer, where do we go from here and how do we get there? When we look at a business plan, the business plan happens after you develop your strategic plan, so it's a level down, and it focuses on a particular program after you have developed your strategies. So in a nutshell, it summarizes the operational and financial objectives of a business program or service, and it has the detailed plans as well as the budget, um, the staffing, showing how the objectives are going to be realized. And business plans can also be used to target changes in perception and branding by the customer, so it could be for marketing purposes. Um, and then it can also be used to explore various issues in advocacy. So when we look at our theory of change, um, and, and I know it sounds really complicated, but a theory of change describes a process of planned social change, and it includes the assumptions that guide its design to the long-term goals it seeks to achieve. And, and we've seen this in many forms. Um, you can present it in, in the uh, form of a map. It can be presented in a more common form that we're used to as a program logic model. And basically what it does is it maps the process for change and it establishes a blueprint for the work ahead. And what it does too is it kind of anticipates the likely effects of the work or the outcome, so to speak, and it reveals what should be evaluated, when and how, and what data needs to be collected. When we look at our mission statement, our mission statement is focusing on the purpose of the organization, why the organization exists, what it does, for whom the organization does it, how they do it. And an example of a mission is to exist, I'm sorry, to assist low-income Garfield community residents to take control of their economic environment through community organizing, financial assistance, and direct service. A vision statement, on the other hand, is a vivid description of how an organization sees itself, its clients, or its environment over the long term. So as a result of all of this activity, that the organization engages in, what do they want to see happen, say, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, assuming that there's no more work to do? So an example from Arlington, Texas, is Arlington will be a diverse and inclusive world-class urban community with secure, attractive residential and commercial neighborhoods where people unite to form a caring, learning, participating, sustainable community in which each person is important. And when we look at our values, we really want to focus at the core, those absolute guiding principles that guide the organization's priorities, operations, and culture. And these are going to guide your decisions, um, concerning your investments, the types of programs you have, how you'll implement the programs, the type of people that you'll hire, the types of companies with whom you work, et cetera, et cetera. One example 
of a value statement is we believe that health care is a human right and not a privilege, and all patients will receive high-quality health care regardless of their ability to pay. So every decision that that hospital makes is going to be made with those core values in mind, and it also helps to remind people in your group of what their core values are. And given the mission, vision, and core values, the organization then begins to focus on goals. And, of course, these goals are informed by the issues that are going on in the environment. And the goals are really the end toward which the program is directed, and it's a general statement of a long-range purpose. So, so basically, what do you want to achieve over the long term? Your goal is going to be consistent with the mission and vision of the organization, and they tend to be outcome-oriented, focused on, you know, what's going to be the impact of all of the strategies that we have or what's going to be the impact of the programs that we're going to have. And they're generally stated as specific, measurable outcomes or changes that can reasonably be expected as a result of the program or strategy. For example, there will be a 5% decrease in the number of freshmen who drop out of high school within the first year of the after-school program. So, so basically, this is what we would consider a SMART goal tells you what's going to happen, it's measurable, it's achievable within the organization's capacity. It's realistically, I mean, I'm sorry, it's realistic and it's timely. The next thing we want to look at is our objectives. And objectives, you know, basically tell you how you're going to reach those goals. You have outcome objectives and you have process objectives. The outcome objectives are, again, focused on what's going to change, and then your process objective is focused on, you know, what happens operationally to achieve that change. So, for example, an outcome objective is there will be a 5% decrease in the number of older adults going into convalescent homes during the first year of a social services referral program, and that demonstrates impact. But when we want to look at the process that needs to occur, um, we can say there will be an increase in social service referral and follow-up for 75% of the individuals served by the new consortium during the 2000-2001 year. So, so basically that's focusing on the nuts and bolts of the activity that the organization will engage in and not what's going to happen to the client as a result of the work. And then when we measure the impact, we need to have key indicators. So we want to be able to uh, to keep track of you know, how we're achieving our goals and objectives, and the measurements just basically give you some sense for how close you are. So, for example, the number of frail adults or the number of referrals provided by the program. So so those are the units that you'll use that tell you how close you are to you, you know, to getting to your goals and objectives. So after we set our goals and objectives, we then look at our strategies and tactics. So the strategies are the overall method achieving organizational goals and objectives over the long term. So they could be a course of action or they could be a program that includes all the objectives, policies, and resource allocation, or it can be an initiative, it can be a project, but whatever it is, it should be proactive in nature and not reactive. And then our tactics are specific activities within those strategies or a work plan, if you would, that will help you to meet the strategy. So as a review, a tactic will help you 
meets your strategies. Your strategies will help you meet your objectives. Your objectives will help you meet your goals. Okay? So if you have any questions, uh, be sure and give me a call at the appropriate time. We've got about six more minutes before we get into questions if you call in. So you want to start with an organizational assessment, and there are a number of ways that you can assess an organization, and you probably should use several of them so you can get a complete picture. You want to look at interviews or focus groups, which are group interviews. You want to examine documents such as the mission statement, bylaws, financial statements, proposals, strategic plans that were done in the past, organizational charts, policies and procedures, stuff to help you get a really, really good picture of what the organization has done in the past, but you don't want to stay stuck in the past, right? And then you also want to get a sense for what's going on. You want to get behind the numbers, so you might want to do surveys and questionnaires, and those surveys and questionnaires can be structured in a way as they get quantitative data or numeric data or qualitative data that describes, you know, the programs and people's attitudes about those programs. And then when you when you do the assessment, you've got to have some questions in mind before you start. Um, the first question, obviously, but so, you know, so many people may even forget to ask this question. Are we ready for a strategic planning process? If we're ready or assuming we're ready, what issues should we address? How should we prioritize the issue? What's our baseline level of organizational capacity? And when we talk about organizational capacity, we're just talking about our organizational systems and the ability of our systems to help us meet our potential in terms of our goals and objectives for the organization. Do we have to complete our mission in this current environment? And if we don't have the resources, what other resources will we need to get? And uh, where, where do we want to go? Will these resources take us there? You also want to do an environmental scan. And, and basically, an environmental scan gives you an overview of what's happening around you, right? So on a macro level, we look at, you know, big picture things. You know, what's happening at the federal government level? What laws are being put in the place that can impact our ability to do our work better, or could it in, impede our work? Could it be a roadblock? We need to look at the political environment. And if you live in the state of Illinois, that's very key right about now. You know, we have a situation where the state of Illinois doesn't have a budget. And, you know, even though traditionally we spent about $28 billion on contracts, most of which for or for nonprofits, all that stuff is put on hold. You know, unless you have a suit in place and you have prevailed in that suit, chances are you're not getting that money. There are organizations that have gone more than a year without money from from the state, even though they have contracts. Uh, looking at what's happening on the national level as far as the economy is concerned. Looking at what's going on in your specific nonprofit sector. So those are the big picture kinds of things. Then we need to drill down and look at, you know, what's happening locally. What's happening in our local communities? What's happening in our cities, our counties, our towns? What are our competitors doing? What's happening with our partners? What's happening with our clients? what's happening with other allies in the community. You know, so no organization is an island. We're all dependent on one another, and the same is true of organizations. Organizations have to exist in, interdependent of other, other agencies. And then we want to look at the governance or decision-making models or our boards, right? 
So the strategic planning process allows organizations to actually explore those alternative models, right? Um, looking at your boards, looking at your committees, looking at your advisory groups. Sometimes you might not want to be so formal, looking at contracts and MOUs, partnerships and joint ventures, and in extreme cases, looking at potential mergers, especially right about now. There's a lot of what we call consolidation in the market because funds are drying up in spite of the fact that we're in recovery. When we look at a really strong process, we will have an allowance for engagement of key stakeholders, so that can be key stakeholders from the government, from the community, and other institutions. And then you'll have strategies that evolve, and they will serve as a basis to decide which programs are developed to address critical issues facing the organization. And now more than ever, we do strategic planning, sometimes you know, along collaborations and not just facing the organization. So you want to also look at models of best practices, not only for a single organization, but models that impact collaboration, and then you want to develop a process for outcome evaluation. The next thing you want to do is analyze your partners and key alliances. So you want to look at partners who have similar missions um, or complementary. They don't necessarily have to be the same, but at least they complement each other, and most importantly, I'm finding not only the mission, but do you have core values that really mesh? You want to create opportunities that are win-win for everybody. You know, you don't want to have lopsided opportunities where one partner gets all the benefit and then the other partner is just there in name only. So I want to open it up for questions before I move further. The call-in number is 347-884-8121. Again, that number is 347-884-8121. And you're listening to Nonprofit U Blog Radio Talk Show, and we're focusing on strategic planning. And right now we're talking about partners and key alliances. So, again, you want to create win-win situations in terms of service delivery, funding opportunities, and administrative services. So some of your potential partners and key alliances could be your funders, other nonprofit organizations, government entities and institutions, other individuals, as well as your clients. And when you look at your clients, you know, literally ask, who are your clients? And I know that sounds uh, very self-explanatory, but really, uh, do you understand your clients? Ask yourself, will your client base change over time or will it remain the same? And you'll have a sense for whether it will change, you know, just from looking at what's going on, you know, in your environment. For example, in the community where I've lived, um, a few years ago, we lost about 1,500 units of affordable housing, most of which were along Douglas Boulevard. And there were several schools along Douglas Boulevard, several youth programs. You know, as a result of all of those units of housing closing at once for renovation, the school attendance went down and hasn't recovered since, and it's been almost 10 years. Um, as a result of that one action, youth programs had to change the way they delivered service. They had to also factor in you know, more money for public transportation because people who had been displaced needed, you know, instead of being able to walk, they needed to get there by bus. So literally one fell swoop. You know, one big action in your community can change, you know, who your client is and how you do business. So it's really important to be in tune to what's happening around you. And then when you think of your client, you know, given who your current clients are, who else can you bring under your big tent? 
Another question is, how can our organization be even more responsive to their needs over the long term? So how can you improve their knowledge? How can you improve their skills? And most importantly, how can you improve their quality of life, their current condition, or, you know, their their wealth? And when we look at our stakeholder, I'm sorry, stakeholders overall, we need to ask ourselves as organizations, how can our stakeholders help us to achieve our long-term goals and objectives? Again, these include funders, these include government entities, these include our clients. Do our stakeholder relationships put us in a position of strength or do they put us in a position of weakness in the marketplace? How do we create partnerships that minimize competition while maximizing community impact? In other words, how do we create synergies? How do we create something that is so good that together we're so much more valuable than we are as individuals? And then when we look at the ground you know, competitively, you know, ask yourselves, who else is doing what we're doing? What services do they offer? Are we duplicating efforts or are we providing a continuum of service? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What differentiates us in the marketplace? Can we compete and win? And nowadays, do we really have to compete? Can we collaborate and win? And then when we look at the market, again, ask ourselves, who are our clients? Who are our funders? Who are our partners? And, you know, and that goes really beyond making a list. It's not so simple as making a grocery list, but really understanding who our customers are, who our partners are, how we're perceived, what is it that we can do for them, what is it that they need, and are we providing that need for them? Um, what is our brand? Are we known for quality? Are we known for reliability? Are we known for consistency? Are we known for equity in our dealings? Again, that goes back to our core values. How do we improve our position? How do we improve the experience that our customers, our partners, and the community has with us? And then when we do risk analysis, we want to be able to mitigate any risk. I mean, you, you can't operate with no risk, but identify the risk and know how do you make it less, um, less risky or how do you address the risk. Are there are the potential rewards worth the risks? What are... Our exit strategies, you know, if we find that we have started something and it doesn't seem to be working out, right, how do we get out and cut our losses? How do we cut our losses financially? How do we cut our losses as far as our reputation is concerned in the marketplace? When we look at our risks legally, you know, what are the legal ramifications? You know, how is this impacting our board structures, how is this you know, going to impact or, or how do contractual arrangements impact our ability to get out of any, um, any endeavor that we have started? What are the liabilities? You know, how much money could we be out of as a result of you know, trying to get out of you know, a, a project earlier than we intended. Politically, you know, what changes in the laws that govern appropriation impact us? And again, folks in Illinois are acutely aware of that question. Um, what changes have occurred in staff at funding institutions, including, you know, public um, public entities like the city? state and federal government, what changes at the community level render our program or service or organization even obsolete? You know, I, I gave you that one example where housing really was impacted. 
and that impacted so many programs and as well as our schools. And again, I want to remind you that you're listening to Nonprofit U. If you have any questions, you can give us a call at 347-884-8121. We're talking about the importance of strategic planning. And if you don't do anything else in your strategic planning process, if you don't have the resources, I encourage you to do a SWOT analysis. And that's basically looking at your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And that's where we get the letter SWOT. So when we look at our strengths, you know, what is it that your organization has that allows you to thrive in the current environment? And then most importantly, how can you exploit these strengths such that you're dominant in the market? And likewise, when we look at our weaknesses, what qualities does our organization have that makes it difficult for us to thrive in this environment? And what are we going to do to shore up that weakness? And in fact, do we even spend time trying to shore up the weaknesses? Do we just focus on our strengths? And those are things, you know, the strengths and weaknesses are things that are inherent qualities of the organization. You know, just like people have strengths and weaknesses, organizations have strengths and weaknesses. Uh, When we look at opportunities and threats, those are things that we have no control over. Those are things that happen in the external environment. So opportunities are those changes that happen in the environment that can actually be good for us and help us move forward. It's like wind beneath our wings, right? And how can we make these work to our advantage? Likewise, there are going to be threats. You know, what's happening that's outside of our control that can keep us from achieving our goals and objectives? And how do we minimize the impact? And when we do a financial analysis, we have to ask ourselves, do we have sufficient financial resources to achieve our long-term goals and objectives? What's our current financial condition? And you want to look at your budget, you know, not only the current budget, but look at your financial, um, you know, the actual financial performance. What's your financial history? You know, look behind you over the past three to five years? Has your trend been positive or negative? Um, And what can you do now? So you don't want to just focus on the past. What can you do now to change the trajectory if it's been negative? What can you do now to maintain where you are? What can you do now to improve where you are? And how much money is it going to actually cost? You know, once you identify those strategies, and those goals and objectives, how much money is it going to cost you over the next two to three years to actually achieve those goals? And then after you identify all those resources, you put a cost to it, you want to be able to actually develop and monitor the work plan. So your work plans need to be developed with input, obviously from the major stakeholders, because these are the people who you're going to be asking to actually do the work. And every goal, objective, strategy, and program needs to be consistent with the organization's mission, vision, and core values, and it should be monitored on a regular basis as part of your board meetings because, remember, this is your strategic plan, this is the strategy, and your board is responsible for monitoring the strategic direction as well as the financial health of the organization. So you want to actually include actual accomplishments versus the plan and make adjustments as necessary. And then you also want to make sure that you have an evaluation plan in place so you can honestly say whether or not you have achieved your stated goal. You want to ask yourself, you know, what can we do differently to improve the program or to improve the organization? And how does this information actually impact our future strategic planning and program development process? 
You want to incorporate new learning into future program development, and your data collection methods need to be developed and integrated into the work plan, and it needs to include tasks, deadlines, and this is the important part, make sure you <laughs> include the name of the person or organization that's responsible because if you don't have names of people or parties that are responsible, guess what? The chances of you getting the work done are very, very slim. So you need to build accountability in the process is what I'm saying. So when you prepare for the strategic planning process, you know, again, you want to conduct an organizational assessment, see, you know, where you're strong, um, what areas need to be shored up. You want to create a core leadership team that is going to actually help you identify those issues and structure the process, and then you want to determine who's actually going to facilitate the process. You know, will you do it internally, or are you going to hire someone from the outside who can be objective, you know, someone who is a professional at this planning stuff. And you actually need to conduct a plan to plan the meeting, and then you want to identify key resources needed to actually, you know, implement your plan. So in a nutshell, you know, we've gone over in about 40 minutes how to actually do a strategic plan. And I, I want to thank you so much for listening to the Nonprofit U Blog Radio Talk Show. If you have any questions before we leave, our number is 347-884-8121. Again, that number is 884-8121. So again, it doesn't look like we have any calls at this point. I want to say thank you again for listening. And if you want to download the show, it will be available within about an hour. And make sure you tune in next week, and we will be talking about performance management. Thank you very much. Take care. When we go out to eat, we never agree on where to go. I want burgers. Pizza. Tacos it is. The one thing we do agree on is we all want unlimited high-speed data. That's why we switch to Metro PCS. Stop by Metro PCS with the whole family and get four lines with unlimited LTE data for just $100, period. Metro PCS. Wireless. Figure it out. Coverage not available in some areas. Offers require reporting of number not currently active on T-Mobile Network. During congestion, the fraction of customers using more than 35 gigs per month may notice reduced speeds. Video streams at up to 40p. No tethering. See store for details and terms and conditions.